Hello, and welcome to the Perry Connection. I am your host, Jesse Barth, and with me is Ray Noel, who is the pastor at the First United Methodist Church in Perry, New York. Ray, thank you for joining us. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I really appreciate it. Uh, you're, you're filling in, and um, you're so gracious. So I appreciate you coming, and actually, you are perfect for this show because we really uh, have been wanting to have a show about Christmas. Well, that's nice. And with uh, your name, Noel. Yes, Noel. Noel, right. and, and it means Christmas. Yes, it does. And you have another special connection with Christmas. Can you share that with our audience? Well, I was very fortunate to have uh, my first uh, child, my first daughter, born on Christmas Eve, 6.34 p.m. <laughs> at Sisters Hospital in Lackawanna. She wasn't due till after Christmas, a few days, so the doctor had to skip supper, you know, his Christmas meal and come down and deliver her. Oh. And he made an announcement on the on the uh, PA system on that floor that, uh, uh, well, we had the first Noel born here tonight because she was <laughs> my first child, so she was yeah. my first Noel. On Christmas Eve. On That's Christmas so Eve. so appropriate. Now, you did not name her a Christmas first name. But no, I didn't. Name? No, people said to name her Angel or Holly or Joy. <laughs> and uh, no, we named her Heather Lynn. Heather so, Lynn. Yeah. Beautiful. Now, is she a pastor? Is she? She's she, not a pastor. My other she, daughter okay. it, preaches sometimes, but okay. she's not a she's not a pastor. My my younger daughter is a very passionate preacher. Yes, I've heard her. She's oh, have you? Yes, she's oh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, she gets she's like she gets wound up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I really appreciated her message. So, tell me about your journey into the the ministry. Well, I tell you, um, I felt a call to ministry uh, when I was. 11, 12 years old, I just got baptized in a little Baptist church in South Bend, Indiana, where I'm from. And, uh, of course, at that age, you know, you know, Can I just stop? How, how did you know that? I mean, well, how did you feel that? I was in a service, and uh, a preacher there, one that I happened to like a lot, uh, uh, was, was talking about, you know, taking time to pause and think about gratitude to God and to Jesus and, and um, you know, to seek what God wants you to do with your life. I believe that every single person has a call to be in some type of ministry, certainly not mm -hmm. ordained ministry or, or to be a preacher, right. but and we're all called. And ministry is really to serve, just a call to serve others. Right, a call to serve others, to love your neighbors as yourself, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that means helping them when they need it. But I didn't, of course, respond at that time, other than to go down and commit my life to Christ, become baptized and become a Christian, or as they say, adopted mm -hmm. into Christ's family. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I was 16, I went with a youth choir from uh, Skeegan, Michigan, over to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on a, on a, on a, uh, a car ferry, but it also took passengers, too. Mm -hmm. And we had a 50, 60 voice youth choir that went over to sing at some of the churches. And during the daytime, we were downtown on a street corner, busy street corners, handing out tracks to people. And it was a hot day in July. And uh, a, a woman came up to me and she says, what are you doing? What's what's young man like you doing out here on a hot day all dressed up? We had to wear blazers and stuff. She says, aren't you, aren't you incredibly warm? And right then, I had this moment of feeling like I'm exactly where I need to be mm -hmm. at this point in time, doing what the Lord wants me to do. Mm -hmm. And I was not warm at all, and normally I am on a hot day. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then I actually didn't respond uh, to begin my pursuit of candidacy process for, with the United Methodist Church until I was 45 years old. Mm -hmm. I felt a call. My wife, we got married at 19, and my wife reminded me that when I was 20, 21, I had felt a call and told her I might, you know, be feeling a call to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. But I was, you know, we had kids and, sure. you know, and as a it. restaurant manager, and we were busy, you know. But mm -hmm. finally, I did respond to Good. the call. When I was writing a sermon, I was a lay speaker, and I was writing a sermon, flipped the Bible open randomly, and somebody had just given me this Bible, a life application uh, living Bible mm -hmm. interpretation, and I randomly opened it to James 1, I think it was verse 4 or 5, 
And in that interpretation, it speaks in clear language, you know, English. It mm -hmm. says, right. if you want to know what the Lord wants you to do with your life, just ask him. But don't ask him if you don't want to know. And that's mm. the part that people may remember from other interpretations. Right. Uh, it, otherwise, it will be like uh, a, a wave being tossed back and forth on the shore into the sea. Mm. In other words, don't waver. Mm -hmm. Make right. a commitment. And so I did. It's really That day, you. I mean, I just felt this overwhelming mm -hmm. uh, presence uh, of God. I didn't hear a voice. I didn't hear angels. But uh, I, I said, you know, Lord, I've been telling you that I've, probably do this for a long time and now I'm going to make a commitment to pursue uh, the candidacy process for minister. Good. Good. So. And that's it, that's um, sort of a Christmas story in itself in that you felt you know some uh, a communic inner communication much like sort of moving into the Christmas story Mary felt you know, and Joseph, that that there is, and I felt, and I know many of in our audience have felt that that nudge or that communication, sort of that angel message to our heart, to say, go this way, do that, and so you're just you're following along the lines of other many other people throughout history who have been called. Right, and most of them, as you know, in the Bible, not most, but many of them said. Why me, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, some of them even said, I'm not going to do that. And yeah. then, you know, and God right. convinced them they were. But uh, yeah. this, you know, another thing that convicted me was that song, Here I Am, Lord. Oh. It is I, Lord. It had just come out a few years before in our mm -hmm. hymnal. And every time I sang that, yes, I've heard you calling. Is it I, Lord? You know, yeah. if you need me, I will go where you. Yeah. And every time I sang it, in the back of my mind, I'd be going, Kind of, sort of. I'm kind of, sort of here. So, right. well, then at the right time, you were able to make that transition. Yes, and I've been a pastor now 21 years. Well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, and I've loved it. Yeah. Well, um, now moving into Christmas, what um, you know for you, what is an ideal? Well, we'll do that a little later. Can can we talk about the meaning of Christmas and? Do you feel in any way that sort of the the essence of Christmas is still with us? You know, we seem to have uh, such a materialistic world now. Um, can you speak to that? Just how we still can feel that that peace and conviction that that there is uh, that what Jesus said is true, that God is love, and that loving is a power. Do you want to speak to that? Right, exactly. Um, you know, the Ten Commandments, the first two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And really, that is basically, to me, what Christmas is. Uh, Jesus exemplifies unconditional love and sacrificial love for his people. And not everybody has heard that message. And some that have heard it think, well, that's just a little bit too unbelievable that God could send his only son to live and teach and then die a very horrible death. But then, of course, if you do believe that, if there was no resurrection, we wouldn't be Christians, right? right. We, our, our Savior would be dead, and right. so would we, basically, when we died. So um, that's uh, the song, Love Came Down at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I forget which pastor it was. He wrote a book called It's Not Your Birthday. And he was pointing out to people that, hey, everybody, you know, well, kids especially want to get gifts, and they want this, and they want that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people really go out of their way to try to get the kids the gifts. And sometimes I think in the, and there's a lot of stress on people at Christmas time with extra parties and extra shopping and things to do. Um, sometimes... It takes until, in, you know, for many people, it takes till Christmas Eve comes. Our church is full on Christmas Eve. I wish it were every other day, but mm -hmm. uh, Christmas Eve service where we just go through Luke 2 and the story of the nativity and uh, the angels and so on, and then conclude the service. And we sing different carols uh, in between the scripture. But at the end, that's my favorite service of the year at the end of the service we lower the lights everybody has a candle and they circle the sanctuary and we 
quietly sing Silent Night, Holy Night. And no matter how busy I am uh, as a pastor with different services and things going on, um, that is the time when I really just look around and see everybody holding the candles. And I think, this is it. This is what Christmas is all about, Jesus' birthday. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the symbolism of the light? Well, sure. The Bible says that the, uh, Christ is the light of the world. And, uh, you know, even recently with this, some of the bad things that have happened, whether they have been hurricanes this year, mass shootings, that type of thing, different people have pointed out that even in the terror and the bad stuff, the light shows up in many, many points of light and the people responding to help others. That's right. And that type of thing. So. Yeah. Well, and that whole idea of um, the light dispelling the darkness. Right. The well, the darkness, of, of course, love. represents evil. As best I could interpret it, the darkness is an evil uh, because of man's uh, and woman's, humankind's uh, predicament, and that is that we're human, and that means that we all are not perfect, and that means that we all sin. And so we are technically in the, like in the darkness until the light of Christ comes into our life and forgives us for those sins. Some people will repent and feel like they've been forgiven and, and really have a joy in their heart. And some people, unfortunately, still beat themselves up over things that they've done or said in years past. But the nice thing about Christmas is love, love that is beyond comprehension, mm -hmm. uh, that came in at Christmas, unconditional, unconditional love. Uh, and it's a hard thing to accept, really, but it's true. Um, God forgives you, and if God forgives you, you really should forgive yourself and move on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think move up. And what I love about Jesus' message is he was always saying repent, which is rethink. Rethink it, you know. And, um, you know, he was always helping people to rethink it, you know, look at, look at it a different way. And um, that's sort of uh, one of the gifts of Christmas, I think, too, is that we can say, oh, I can forgive myself, or I can forgive my neighbor. And in fact, I have to. <laughs> in fact, I love to look at words, and of course, John 1, in the beginning, was the word. And I think it's interesting that the word uh, free is related to the word friend. And I just thought, we're not really free unless we're friends. You know, eventually we have to love one another, and um, and that the Christmas message is a way to free, free us from, uh, you know, thinking that we shouldn't be thinking about other people or about ourselves. And right, it's a beautiful cleansing. Absolutely, uh, and Jesus message. was the example of reaching out to the sick the ones that were scorned by others, right. whether they be lepers or prostitutes and that type of thing. And so people that think, um, well, I'm better than them because I'm not a prostitute and I've not killed anybody and so on and so forth, you're still a sinner. And you still need the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people describe the lack of Christ in people's lives as like having a heart-shaped hole in your chest and the only thing that can really fill it is a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Once you have that, uh, you know that, you know, no matter how bad things get, and we're gonna we're gonna have trials and tribulations right. in life. Christ and God will walk with you, like even through the valley of the shadow of death. Right. And that is song. that is love, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what would you say to someone who's watching that a doesn't really, you know, believe in God or good, uh, and uh, and also uh, sort of a second part of that question is a lot of people feel depressed at Christmas. 
Yes. What, what, what would you say to a person who uh, is depressed at this point, if someone is watching and just feeling like, oh, just same old, same old? Or well, if they're, if, they're, if they're depressed to the point where they won't leave the house or they won't even take phone calls from people and stuff, then I would really suggest that they uh, call someone, you know, a professional, and talk about it, first of all, if it's a deep depression. But a lot of people are in a funk, so to speak, at Christmas time. And a lot of those people are people that have lost a child or a spouse, okay, or they're disenfranchised or not getting along with relatives, and so they're not invited to mm -hmm. celebrate together. And um, so they're lonely, and they're miserable. And just like on Mother's Day, where we can't assume that every single person had the kind of mother that they should honor and be proud of, although I think, you know, you only have one mom. Likewise, we shouldn't just assume that everybody is decking the halls and fa la 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 mm -hmm. uh, just because we are. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say, and, and, and of course, to learn more about God, the perfect source is the Bible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, with the Internet, there's a lot of bad stuff out there, but there's an awful lot of things out there that you can go to on the Internet even mm -hmm. and get more information and, and ask the questions that you need to have answered. You may not get them all answered, but if we had the answer to every single question, why would we need to have faith? Faith is believing the things that we can't see and perhaps can't understand. So if they want to know more, and of course I would invite them to uh, find a church. Mm -hmm. You know, go to a church, find a community of, of believers who welcome them, because everybody has to start their journey of faith someplace. Right. And to grow in your faith takes nurturing, not just from God, but from other people. Uh, learning, teaching, nurturing, loving support. Mm -hmm. I think, too, that, that once again, always going back to love, sometimes when you're in a funk, it helps to love someone else. You Absolutely. Know, I find that if I'm down, usually I'm thinking about myself too much. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just mm -hmm. helps to... To really think, well, who who can I help? And maybe that's a way of lifting up out of that. We have yeah. a lot of people at our church that when somebody loses a relative or somebody's husband has been hospitalized or the spouse or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they make sure that they take a meal over, that they call regularly, that they offer to drive them to appointments or whatever it needs to be. And... And they also, of course, support missionaries around the world, and they've helped sponsor me on trips to Uganda and to Nicaragua in the last few yeah. years. Uh, and uh, I tell you, by going to Uganda, you find out how good we have it in the United States. That doesn't mean we don't have problems. It doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. But I couldn't even begin to imagine the challenges daily of just getting drinking water and food to feed the family that so many people in Uganda do, and of course many other countries around the world. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think too, at Christmas it's a really is a time to number one count your blessings, but also to really um, pray for the world, too, and just you know really I, I think I love the symbolism you talked about with everyone in the circle with the candles lit at the Christmas Eve service. That that sort of is symbolic of the world, all of us in that family of light um, linked together in our... Like your Coke commercial yeah. where they said, I'd like to teach the, the world, world to sing in perfect harmony. That's right. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, yeah. Give peace a chance, as John That's right. Lennon said. Now, um, you have such a pretty singing voice. Do you have a favorite carol? What, can you talk about the role of music? Oh, yes. In, well, the, my favorite and... carol has to be Silent Night. I, I, it just it moves me. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I insist that we sing it once or twice, you know, either in late November, December, or even into early January, because it's a beautiful song, and it just touches me to the core every time mm -hmm. I sing it. Um, Do you know the story of behind the Silent Night? Do I you know used that? to, but you know. Yeah, um, I, I'm just pulling this out of the. Right. The file cabinet, but I, I think it was it um, Joseph Moore, M 
M O H R. I don't know that, yeah. but at any rate, um, it was written in German, Germany, mm -hmm. and um, there was um, no no tree, no decoration, no anything, and so to make um, this Christmas uh, Eve service special, this choir director, uh, composer, composed Silent Night and taught it to the, the church. So it really had its birth on Christmas Eve, and so it seems very appropriate. And it's just been passed down throughout the years. And of course, I love Joy to the World. Yeah. And the first Noel. <laughs> yeah, and isn't it fun that they, of course, the first yeah, Noel. Yeah, because my daughter was my first Noel, but <laughs> that's not the only reason, but yes. Well, they're, they're yeah, just right. such fun to sing, and it's, yeah. you know, once again, they just bring everybody together. You know, people grow up singing these carols, and, you know, sacred carols, secular carols. You know, and how do you, um, how do you sort of balance the, you know, the sacred Christmas with the secular Christmas celebration is that does that ever seem like co conflicting for you or or how do you think about that what do you think about that well I used to push myself really hard before Christmas and of course my wife and other relatives do too because you know they've got other things to do and they've still got these extra things mm -hmm. to do and I used to put a lot of pressure on going from store to store and battling the crowds and finding the you know the cabbage patch kid that's way back when <laughs> oh, you know yes. that the daughter wanted and that you know, that I that remember. shows my age doesn't oh, it yes I don't yes know. I remember but uh, <laughs> and so I, I got to be honest with you when I would go into the stores and people would be you know shoving and grabbing and not real patient with other people. Yeah. Then I would see the beautiful lights, and sometimes they'd be playing carols, you know, Christmas mm -hmm. carols in the store. And I would just have to stop and think, boy, oh boy, you know, like the book title, It's Not Your Birthday, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's not like my, it wasn't check. my kids' birthdays, yeah. although it was close for my first yeah. daughter for Christmas right. Eve, but, you know, the basically for most people, it's not their birthday on yeah. Christmas Day. And, uh, they need to think about the real celebration. Well, you know, it's so interesting that you would uh, mention that because um, our family is a blended family. Oh, yes. And so we did not always celebrate our Christmas on Christmas Day. Right. Because, you know, there are other parents and what have you. And so one year we celebrated it on Christmas Eve Day. Mm. And so uh, we all, you know, our five children and we all opened our gifts together and what have you and um, and then I went to the local Walmart to get something for for the Christmas dinner and with it for us it all the presents had been opened it felt like Christmas Day and so I went into Walmart and you could feel the tension with a knife you could have cut it with a knife you could just see it the stress in people's faces you know and that uh, and and I that really hit home to me like oh my gosh we put ourselves through this drama and this tension that really has nothing to do with the message of just love one another and so, accept the love that came down from Christmas there's yeah. no gift you can buy anybody that's going to compare to the gift of Jesus Christ and uh, and it's, it's a gift you can accept freely yeah. that's really one of the hardest things for people to accept yeah. is that God loves each and every one of us as if there's only one of us to love. That's right. And wants to have a personal relationship with the billions of people uh, across the, the world um, and provide them with grace and hope and peace and strength. And, of course, the greatest gift is love. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Now, do you have um, a favorite Christmas memory? We're going to be wrapping up the show, believe it or not, soon. So oh, what, what's your favorite? We could go on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will after the camera's off. But, uh, well, the most memorable one in terms of drama was uh, when we were coming. Uh, we were living in uh, the Indianapolis area. I used to be in restaurant management, and I got transferred out there. And we were driving up to uh, western New York to... Uh, to the Buffalo area, 
and we were supposed to be there for my daughter's Christmas Eve for my daughter's uh, birthday party at my aunt and uncle's house, and they always made a special cake, whatever mm -hmm. she wanted. And the, the, the weather, you know, was horrible before we even got into uh, Pennsylvania, north, uh, uh, east Ohio. Bad storms, bad snow, terrible. And, and we went onto the New York State Thruway, and we didn't even know it was technically closed. They didn't have the gates oh. back then. This is back in, wow. you know, early to mid-'80s. And uh, so a bunch of snow. There must have been a plow that went over a viaduct above us, and a bunch of snow came down on my car. And uh, there was one other car we were following, and I was afraid. And there was one car behind us, and I was afraid to to stop, mm -hmm. but I couldn't see anything. So I tried to pull over to the side of the road, and we got stuck in the median in a snowbank. Oh. And the fellow that was following us stopped, and he was going to see his girlfriend in Buffalo. And he had a great big Buick, and there was the four of us. And he said, well, put your luggage and Christmas presents, which you have in the trunk and the car, and we're all crammed in there. <laughs> and literally, my wife and I took turns hanging our head out the window to be able to see better for him. Yeah. And, and he made it and took us right to, not my aunt and uncle's house, but he took us to Orchard Park to my wife's parents' house. And that's where we, we didn't get into like one in the morning, so obviously we missed mm. the si six o'clock supper mm. at my aunt's house. But I'll never forget that, and I guarantee you, my first Noel daughter will never forget oh. it either. Yeah. How, how but lovely. how nice of a stranger oh my, to do that, Yes, you know, to do that was just phenomenal. Uh, an outstanding young man that came along and did that. And that is unselfishness, and that is loving your neighbor. That's right. And, and he tried to make Christmas it sound, message. yeah, and of course he tried to make it sound like, well, you're doing me a favor. I hate to be out here alone anyhow. Well, he so rescued us. what did you do us. with your car? What happened to your it was, car? It was in the uh, median strip, and the, the throughway is closed for two days. And the day after Christmas... My father-in-law and I went with his pickup truck, and he had to come along and chain, and we winched it out after we dug and dug oh, wow. and winched it out, and it started, and we were able to get up to Buffalo. But this was, uh, this was, you know, the way out on the western end of the New York State Thruway. So. That is a beautiful Christmas story. It is, because we made it. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was safe. Right. That's and right. it it's something very vividly kept in our minds. It's sort of like the no room at the inn, you know? There you go. You know? you. Oh, I forgot Oof. one other thing. There was a four-wheel drive Jeep I, uh, that went off the road also. And when we went by them, he stopped. And it was one person. And so now there's five of us plus him. And we took that person into Erie. Well, this was before Erie then, wasn't it? Because we went down onto US-20 and came in that way, and it was easier to see mm -hmm. than, than on the throughway. So, yeah. What a beautiful story. Well, thank you. Now, you are the pastor at the First United Methodist Church in Perry, and That's so right. you will be having a Christmas Eve service. Do you yes. want to just talk about that? Okay, sure, yeah. If, uh, if you don't have plans for Christmas Eve, come on over at 715. We usually have a brass choir that plays for 15 minutes and then at 7 30 we start our traditional service of carols and candles and of course we conclude it with silent night and people hugging and wishing each other <laughs> merry christmas and uh, we're finished usually right at 8 30 so uh, come and join us and uh, feel feel the love that came down at christmas that's beautiful thank you thank you oh you're welcome it's wonderful Thank but you. nice talking to you, yes, Jesse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.